Hello everyone, thank you for coming to this uh, far away place, <laughs> far off corner. My mum my mom was saying, where is this place? Because she used to teach at Telopaku. So this is the wrong direction of Changi. Uh, as you will see later on in the presentation, where we are relative to the old Changi. This is to me, new Changi. Okay, so the title of the talk is uh, Seven Stories of the Changi Area Through Historical Maps and Charts. Originally, it was five stories. Then I got greedy. Now I regret. <laughs> I, I can't tell all seven stories in this uh, time slot. <laughs> so I'll try to uh, hasten the, the storytelling. So this, this event came about in, um, because of this photograph. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Teo Chi Hien visited Spain in uh, March 12th of uh, this year, earlier. And uh, he posted this photograph on his Facebook the director of the Madrid Navy Naval Museum presented with him this reprinted chart of Singapore, produced by someone from Spain, dated 1778. So I was sent this uh, map, and I've never seen this map before. So well, I picked my curiosity, and then soon enough, I'm 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 standing here talking to you, <laughs> telling you the story of this map, which I found a bit of the background. Uh, I wrote to the museum itself and some response from that. Later on, I'll tell more about it. This will be the key, one of the key stories for today. And incidentally, in this whole series of stories, I have chosen the um, half, six, six, six stories, um, uh, what shall I say, three stories from pre-1819, three stories from after the 1819, and there'll be one story that relates to the approaching bicentennial next year. And uh, some people have commented that we have focused too much on the pre-1819 uh, since the uh, the revision of the SG700 syllabus in school. So I'm trying to put that back also to the 1819 period where Raffles came to Singapore and started all the former mapping in Singapore. Of course, before the Raffles uh, British came here, the various European powers have been charting and mapping this area, as you can see from this Spanish chart and the story behind it. Well, that's, that's later on. So this is the background to this talk, inspired by this photograph on Facebook. Facebook, very dangerous. <laughs> Get you into all sorts of unnecessary trouble. So here I begin. This is Changi, as defined in the 20th century. The British Army Armed Forces actually wanted to defend Changi area because of the identification for this area to defend the Navy base in Sambawang, the entrance to the place. So they, rather than saying that oh, uh, one particular area in Changi, they used the holistic approach in a scientific way which is the uh, piece of land that projects into the body of water and is connected with the larger land mass. This is very scientific. To me, the cultural version is um, a body of land surrounded by three, -sided of, three sides of water. This is the more cultural kind of uh, explanation. So Changi looks like that in the military, traditional military map. So there are three, so one side, two side, and three sides. So this fits the definition of a peninsula. So the British Army define this as a peninsula and they defend it like a peninsula, like a cat, because there are certain types of uh, infrastructure and defense structures to, to defend this sort of uh, land mass. And hence, Changi being a, a settlement name and the river's name and so on, become a larger area peninsula. And as we can see later on, the, because of the construction of the British military base, subsequently air base, and then the airport, and the name got extended throughout this whole eastern seaboard of Singapore. And even now, this Navy base, actually technically the land, the, the name isn't Changi, but now it's Changi Navy base. This used to be Tanamera, which is the Tanamera Coast route outside, right? Yeah, there are different names for this part of Singapore, but now this name has been extended to this part of Changi. So that's why I call New, New Changi, in a way. Yeah. Okay, this is a World War II Australian produced map. So in, nowadays, uh, World War II research is getting more and more easier and popular. So this, you encounter the name Changi Peninsula quite often in a lot of World War II records and uh, books and so on. So here, now we start this introduction to Changi Peninsula. Uh, I have to draw a lot of water for this and pay attention to this, this yellow dot here. Stare at it for a while. Uh, let it sink into your mind. This is the dot where we are now sitting. <laughs> Yeah, magic, uh, magic. Yeah, you, know, you, can, you can stand on water now. Yeah, this is where it is. This is from 1966, before the uh, reclamation started. 1960, oh, this small. So this is 1966, the uh, coastline, the old peninsula look. And 1983, a little bit of reclamation for the airport, but still, 
Here you can see this um, structure over here, Johor Shore. Can't see very clearly Johor Shore. And this is called Redcliffe Bank and Redcliffe Shore. So all these are shallow water. And that's the shape looks familiar to what we see today after the reclamation, but the dot you see is still in the water at that time. And this is 2018, today's map. So you can see just now from that structure of the shore and the bank, this is the shallow water. So the reclamation took this shape. So we are, we are here. And to compare, I've overlaid that map. The Navy base is over here. You see the structure over here and then the old uh, phantom lines, uh, the dead lines. Yeah, Changi Airport and so on. So this is Changi. And where we are today, sitting here, Tanah Merah area actually. Or to be more specific, it's uh, Johor Shore. Yeah. So on, if you want to post where you are, you know those Facebook, uh, where I am now, Johor Shore. Then people say, wow, you're in the water, man. <laughs> this is the thing. Yeah. So I, I like to attend classical music concert. And a lot of time now to save money, they don't print program this thing. I get agitated. So I prepared this very nice detailed program at least you know if you are, uh, know this story already, like, uh, what? I'm not interested in item number three or five, then you can switch off. At least you can prepare beforehand. Uh. So I have these seven stories, and I'm, as I say, three stories predate British arrival, and three stories uh, after uh, 1819. And then the last one, I put in the 1819 link to the story of Singapore. So the first one is from 1577. The second story is from 1603, and all this relates to battles that, fought, that were fought in the Changi area, just off the coast of Changi, the old Changi, not, not particularly here, but as you can see, the whole eastern seaboard of Singapore Island was witness uh, to these particular battles uh, in those days. So it's a critical, uh, how should I say, um, waterway or water body. Uh, many uh, exchanges took place, oops, sorry. I run the thing too fast. Then the third one is the 1778 Spanish chart. That one has a long, long story, and I'll try to keep it short. Then followed, we jump to the 20th century um, with the Changi tree, the one quite famous, uh, Changi tree. But I'll show some of the things that were not available uh, on the web. Oh, incidentally, uh, the details of the stories is proportional to the availability of the information on the internet. So now if you start searching on the web, uh, what you can find a lot, uh, I will not say much here. I only introduce the map here so that you are aware of the existence of these important maps in Singapore's history. I will say a lot of things about the things that you cannot find on the web at the moment. So these are more of my original research. So I compiled it because everyone took their time and come to this place, my goodness, it's in the middle of the water. So I must let you all have something to bring back home and, and uh, share with other people. Uh, so this is, wow. Uh, this is some of the stories. Then the World War II stories, two World War II stories, and uh, subsequently the 1819 stories. So, so I'll proceed with the first story. Uh, this is a bit complicated. Uh. It's uh, about the Achenese, Achenese uh, from Aceh, Sumatra, North Tip of thing, and the uh, Portuguese. In 1511, uh, uh, Portuguese finally came to this area and occupied Malacca. The Achen, Achenese uh, are not happy with that uh, occupation. So they have been attacking Malacca and so on. That means disturbing the Portuguese control of this area, Straits of Malacca and so on. So this battle lasted for decades. So in one of these battles, in 1577, finally the Achenese tried to block this area up the Johor River. That means just actually behind you, up that area. Johor River is up there. So the Portuguese happened to sail by this area and discovered the Achenese fleet and they started fighting. And this map, the story of this battle is recorded by someone called Iridia, and this is the map that was in his account from 1615. He's a famous Malay Portuguese uh, cartographer and uh, sort of like a re recorder, so he recorded this event. Uh, this map was introduced to me by one of the members of the audience, and he refused to be introduced. So, <laughs> so this, this is the map. This is the area of uh, the coastal area. I will show the details later on. This is the, just a, a few of the map, how it looked like. I have added in annotations, so you can see Johor Coast. This map is oriented north, north up. Yeah. So these are some of the. This is the main commander of the uh, Portuguese fleet. This is his, uh, you know, I say second in command of the fleet. So all these with oars uh, are the Achenese uh, ships. Uh. So they are attacking the Portuguese, which are ships with these sails and so on. So these small ships are the Achenese. So this battle is quite uh, major, and you can see this uh, smoke from the guns. This is literally the smoking gun captured in this painting. So, I think was ongoing. 
And one thing I want you to note is this name here, Tanjong Rusa. Tanjong Rusa, this name mentioned here. Changi is not mentioned on our coastline, on this coastline at all. And then this long, this long tip, I suspect is Johor Shore, just now I pointed out. I'll, I'll show more about this Johor Shore later on. And this island here, I suspect is Pulau Tekong. And uh, should be, uh, but I don't know. And just to compare the old and the new. Uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> Wrong. Not familiar with this. So this is the orientation. So we are here. Johor Shore is here. Tekong is here. So this is the area roughly of the operation. Okay, this is the, the Changi I talk about. The, the island uh, that is marked Changi, uh, I suspect is Tekong. So um, I have two questions uh, out from this thing. The Archinese and Portuguese story is very complicated. People write theses on this, a uh, whole master's thesis and PhD thesis. So you can go on the web, use these keywords, and then search for those accounts. But this kind of, uh, these particular two questions uh, cannot be found on the web. So number one, I suspect that the, this is just my speculation. Uh, the name Changi could be Pulau Tekong. Again, like our Changi Navy base today, the name spread to the mainland of Changi coast. And then the name starts to expand until today. This is just my speculation. Then number two, I talk about the Achenese and Portuguese. Uh, the Portuguese won the battle eventually. The Achenese, although you see so many small, small ships, right, the, they lost the battle. And the commander of the flotilla killed himself. That's the legend. And people on Pulau, Pulau Tekong, Pulau Tekong actually has this uh, belief, the Tuan belief, Tuan Pekong Temple. And it's not Tuan Pekong, it's Tuan Pekong. So this Tuan is believed to be the Archinese commander, according to the legend from Pulau Tekong Islanders. So this is the story. And it's originally a rock that is worshipped on Pulau Sejahat. And they, according to their legend, this is the commander who killed himself during this particular battle. And it's quite interesting that this, this map came about in this uh, Portuguese National Library. They found this document, long lost to be uh, lost. And now you can see it. So this is the Tuan Pekong story. And this is more relevant to today's Singapore and in terms of the search of heritage and uh, our history. So that's the first map. Second map is this uh, quite famous 1603 uh, Dutch-Portuguese battle. Again, another battle. And, but this battle relates to something known as Santa Catarina incident, a ship, a Portuguese ship. Uh, this, this map, uh, the name is quite complicated, so I shall read the English version. A charge of a skirmish between the Dutch and the Portuguese in the Balu, Balu Saba River. It's Patu Saba River. So it was published in 1607 in Frankfurt by this famous Debris family, uh, German map makers. This is the first map uh, believed to have um, up close depiction of Singapore coastline in this map. This is the title block, just in case you want to see the details. The inside, uh, inside this title block, besides the uh, description which I read just now, it starts with a listing of A to O ships, number of the ships that is depict, depicted in the map itself. There are various, various ships over here, A, B, C, D, until O. And uh, they're described here. And uh, they are in some kind of old German. I cannot read. It is a very challenging thing. Go old Portuguese, old Spanish, old German. Even modern Europeans cannot read these maps. <laughs> so the background to this battle happened in the March, oh, uh, March or eighth February of 1603. Well, wow, the dates are too confusing. <laughs> Santa Catarina was a Portuguese ship, and uh, it was captured by the uh, Dutch, uh, uh, sort of like should I say privateers, uh, against the. Uh, current law at that time. So the Portuguese raised their ob objection to this particular uh, capture. But the, uh, the incident um, was significant in three sense. Number one, it sort of uh, formed the former diplomatic relationship between the Dutch and the Johorian Empire. That's one. Uh, former, prior to that, there was this no formal relationship. Then second incident is the uh, Portuguese trade secrets were leaked. Because after the capture of the Portuguese ship, what? The Portuguese have been secretly trading it from this area. It's now known to the rest of the European powers, and they know, wow, what kind of treasures is in, in this area. So the other European countries start wanting to come here and trade and or actually pillage the area, actually. Then the third most critical thing is that this act was considered a piracy, act of piracy at that time, because of the current laws at that time. So the Dutch uh, government appointed this guy called 
Hugo Grotes uh, to write a justification for their action, to justify this action. A little bit like uh, some president of some country doing this, and then they write something to justify it. But anyway, <laughs> in the battle in this 1607 map, um, the, the battle took place from 6 to 11 October, but the actual battle, which is depicted in that moment, is on the 10th of October. And uh, they were trying to break the uh, blockade of the Johor River, as I say. It's actually similar to the other battle of 1577. Every time people want to block the, the access to the upper reaches of Johor River, someone will come in and try to uh, breach the blockade. Uh. So depending on who, and who, who is friendly with whom at the time and who is allied, allied with someone else at the time, and uh, they change partners. Uh. Johor sometimes is friendly with the Portuguese and then sometimes they switch to the Dutch. So sometimes the storyteller get very confused. You have to check the dates properly. So in this case, now the Portuguese is blocking the Johor River. And uh, the Dutch came in with 40 large galleys, a galleon. And the Portuguese have 40 smaller ships. So they tried to use those swarming methods uh, to fight this battle. Eventually, the Portuguese lost and the Dutch has this victory. So this is the, um, the battle that is depicted here. This is the follow-up to the Santa Catarina incident. They want to revenge uh, in a way that the earlier in the year, this Santa Catarina was captured. So the aftermath of the Santa Catarina incident, this Hugo Crotus uh, eventually wrote this uh, pamphlet called the uh, Free Sea, and it was published in 1609. Eventually, it was um, sort of like the principle, adopted the principle that the sea is uh, international um, territory and it was uh, free for every country to use it for free trade. This is against Portuguese closed sea principle. So the Portuguese hold to the other view that this is their own thing, that you cannot come in and take anything that you want. And uh, by claiming these free seas, uh, Dutch justified the action uh, in taking the ship in this area, open uh, free high waters uh, in a way. But uh, the last point, Britain at that time was against this principle of the free sea. Uh, so you take note of this. At that time, Britain has not come to Singapore yet, but eventually this will affect their relationship in the next round of battle and between the European countries. Yes, the Portuguese uh, close sea policy. So this is the comparison between the two maps. <laughs> I've, I've uh, put in some numbers. This is the coastal area of Singapore Island, but number one here apparently refers to this exit. Uh, this is actually the Strait of uh, Johor, this area. At that time, they didn't know that this was actually a full uh, strait, so they thought it's a river mouth. So this is number one. Number two is Singapore River over here. Number three is this Johor shore area, number three. And then Bintan is here, Bintan, uh, Batam. Batam as if like a coastal profile, Batam Island. And Karimon, this map carries on until Karimon Island, which is off the chart on, on this side. So again, this, this map is pointed east up. And the battle took place over here this river mouth of Johor River. So that's the uh, comparison. And to close up on the area, these are the Achini ship, the smaller ships. The Portuguese ships are not so big, so they swarm them. The Dutch are having these big, big galleys, galleons, galleys are something else, galleons. So the, um, this overwhelming um, sort of disparity uh, in terms of uh, firepower. So eventually the Portuguese lost in this battle. So I want to point out this part, Johor Shore. This is the Johor Shore, which uh, Tanah Merah, this Navy base is now more or less built on this Johor Shore, this area somewhere here. So uh, very close to the battle at that time. Okay, next I'll move to this highlight of this talk, the one that uh, has um, top view in the poster. Again, this same image. Uh, it was on the 12th of March 2018. Anyone has it a guess what was the significance of the day, 12th of March 2018? Never mind, it was Commonwealth Day. <laughs> no one would have thought of it because Commonwealth Day is on the what, second Monday of March. Commonwealth, British Commonwealth, British Empire. Now we have totally forgotten about British Empire. Yeah, but anyway, this is this year's Commonwealth Day. So that was the significance of the year. It was, it was, I put it in my Google calendar, so I didn't know about it until I was checking the day. Hey, what is this Commonwealth Day? Yeah, so this is uh, DPM Teo Chuyen's Facebook post, the exact post. I do a screen capture of it. And uh, after, after seeing that thing, I got curious. So one day I thought to myself, um, why not I try to write to the same museum and see if I can buy a copy of it. And I wrote them an email. Uh, 10 days went past, uh, no news. 
Then that evening, suddenly there's incoming email with a WeTransfer link. So they sent me a full high resolution copy of this map. So this is from the same uh, museum. <laughs> DPM don't have only a printed copy. I can print to whatever I like. High resolution screen. So I'm showing it here now. The same image. Uh, this is what he posted there, and this is how he got his version. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of dignitaries give them printed ones. Uh. So I got the high resolution digital print. So you can do a lot of interesting things to it. So this is the uh, this is the image. Uh. So next, again, a uh, big picture. Uh. This is very dry. Uh. A lot of big, big picture. But the significance of this thing uh, is that the there was something against the British and the English and the English and the French and the Spanish in Europe actually, but something accumulated in this Seven Years' War. And during that period, England actually occupied Manila for just a brief two years, 16, 1762 to 1764. And this triggered off the Spanish concern that they, they want to, at that time, because the, the Spanish had been uh, shipping from uh, New, New Spain, which is Mexico, through the Pacific, to the area. So now Britain, from this western side, has occupied Manila. So they are concerned, the Spain, Spanish themselves are concerned that, wow, this route is no longer secure. They want to check out the viability of shipping directly from the west uh, towards the west side. Uh, that is not, not going by the, uh, towards the east side, through the Indian Ocean. That's one, that's one uh, trigger for this uh, course of action. And uh, then they started this Cadiz trade route, uh, which is not to go through Spanish uh, New, New Spain in Mexico. They go directly from Indian Ocean, which is what the Portuguese have been doing. I'll show you the map later on. This is the big picture. A lot, a lot of dates and so on, not, not important. But they try it from 1765 to 1815 until it's no longer viable. Other countries are doing their tricks and it's no longer for the, uh, not, not, not so special anymore. And it's too costly to maintain this sort of uh, trade routes. The more important thing is the third point. The Spain have this map of Singapore because they, they were here to try out this route based on the same principle that Hugo Grotius proposed. They were against the closed sea principle. So Spain made use of the same free sea, open sea principle to go against the agreement that uh, they shouldn't sail from the Indian Ocean to Philippines. So this is the thing, the significance of the previous map and this particular map. Then, of course, the next year, this map was 1778, or at least the date was on 1778. The next year, 1779, uh, <laughs> France and Spain had this uh, form an armada to attack Britain, but it was a failure. But it start, started this something known as the Anglo-Spanish War. This is not the first one. There were many Anglo-Spanish War, but this is a particular phase. And this was actually part of the extension of the American Revolution War, which, as you know, 1776. Uh, yeah. So this is the aftermath of that particular drag out war. So it's very confusing from the old, war, old world, it moved to the new world, and then we actually spread all the way to where we are in, in Southeast Asia. So this is the political background. So back to the map. So the, the story of this uh, whole thing comes from Columbus discovering the new world. And at the time, the, the church wanted to define the boundary where, where the Spain and the Portuguese powers uh, can trade. So what they have is the Treaty of Tordesillas from 1494. So they drew a line in the middle of the Atlantic and the line passed through the tip of this uh, Brazil. So in the end, Spain gets the area west of it and Portugal gets the area east of this line. Essentially, the world was divided into two spheres of influence. So the Spain on this side and Portuguese on this side. Okay, that's the uh, thing. And, uh, but when this was done, um, they realized that the world is round, right? The world is round. So what happened to the other side of the globe? There's no line defining where the two powers have to divide their things. So to rectify that, so there's something called Treaty of Zaragoza in 1529 to add in a, in a way like 18, 180 degrees to the other side of the thing. So the line passed through somewhere in Australia, actually. This is the modern depiction based on more accurate, more accurate, uh, uh, how should I say, shape and size of the earth today. And uh, depending on who is drawing the line, the, the, Spain, the Spanish would draw the line very close to, say, Malacca. The Portuguese would draw something like this, very close to uh, east of Philippines, so you can get more access to the Spice Island over here. So this line actually affected the, the delimitation of the state boundary between Western Australia and South Australia even, 129 degrees east uh, of the longitude. 
So, so for many years, the boundary between the two states are not clearly defined, and it, it dates back to all this old, old way of thinking, but that's another story. But anyway, Portugal and Spain divide the world into two halves. So that's the background of the big, big picture of this thing, and the Portuguese, that closely principle, comes from this original ruling. So they want to protect their interests based on this thing. So the other countries, like Dutch, would say, ah, I don't care, this is my literally a new world order. So the free sea principle applies. So they can go anywhere and do whatever they want. And this is the old way of doing things. And uh, Spain now see that uh, the Dutch have come up with this new principle, try to adopt the same principle. So they, so they say, we will go through the same route that the Portuguese have been taking. And they want to try out this new route. So this is the Pacific Century route, the Spanish realm. So this is the New Spain in Mexico. So they usually go by this way from Spain to Mexico and then come to Manila, the traditional route. So now they want to try the Portuguese route, the blue route, which is here. So in the 1765, they started this experiment. So this map, uh, according to the museum, they say they do not know who produced it, but it was dated 1778 by the uh, maker of that map. And uh, the map was collected in 1797 when the Spanish Navy uh, started their own directorate of hydrography. So this is the title block, um, something about the chart of navigation, Karimon to the island of Timon, Ao and uh, Pisang, through the Strait of Malacca. And uh, again, uh, this is old Spanish. More, more importantly, uh, I noted this particular word. Monjour, Mr. De Apre or something. It's a French, French name. This is a very famous person. This is the only part that I know. This guy, this guy. Yeah, he is actually uh, the uh, director of mapping for the French East India Company. He produced a, a very significant atlas. So this is his name. This is actually not his full name. In between John Baptist and this famous word is actually Nicholas Dennis. So it's J, B, N, D, then D, and M. So very long. So for librarian, it's a nightmare. <laughs> you don't know which is the first name, middle name, and second middle name, third middle name, and so on. So, so you can see that, that Spanish guy used this as his identification. So a lot of us now use this, this part. Or just this one, or this one. Not, not, not the first four names. So this is his name. So he produced this atlas, the Neptune Oriental. 1745, and this is the chart that covers the southern tip of Malaya and Singapore. This is a very important chart. Many countries copy this. And to me, these two names, uh, Neptune and Oriental, were once upon a time uh, household brands in Singapore. Now, sorry man, no more already. Eh? Yeah, Oriental went bust and then Neptune also gone. So from that chart, I come to the, how should I say, mapping significance of this map. Uh, Tanah Merah, where we are, the namesake of this coast route, Tanah Merah. Um, in 1604, Iridia has a map that has Tanah Merah, the exact name on it. Then after that, uh, for the next 100 years or so, no European maps have a name for this area. Tanah Merah or whatever name we don't have. So in that promotion, uh, if you read the promotion material, uh, Mok Laing saw something on this map. Uh, uh, this is the something I saw. <laughs> this is the something I saw. Oops, uh, too fast, too excited. Uh, this, this part, this part, this eastern part of Singapore. So it's spelled this Barancas Coloradas, which is, according to Google, is red ravines and gully. I hope Google is correct. And incidentally, if you use Catalan or Basque, or one of those uh, regional Spanish languages, uh, it translates better than using Spain. If you type in those texts, uh, just now if you take photograph, uh, type in those texts, uh, you use some of these regional Spanish word languages, it translates better than Spain. Spain has uh, modernized their spelling and words. Anyway, this is the area. And this is the, you see the, the coastal area, this is the spelling. And then the depiction uh, is really uh, galleys and uh, ravines. You can see the actual shape and size of it. Um, no other European maps I've seen. I may, I may not have seen every or enough, but I don't see any from the 18th century, that means 1700s onwards until the before Raffles came, that such detail uh, is depicted on the European chart of this area, the Tanam Era coast area. Usually, I will show you two examples from British, British mapping. This is the French one, the original one. Nothing, no name, it's just some irregular coastline. Uh, incidentally, the, the make, maker of this 78 map actually wrote in the title block that he actually supplies information, update information, while here, to Mr. Mr. Manavillet himself. 
and this is the British chart. This is a British Royal Navy chart. HMS Russell, 1804, he, they came by, sailed by Singapore area and published in 1807. So the detail in the area is uh, it has a remarkable red, red patch. So this is what the English uh, chart makers or at least the hydrographers noted of this area, Tanamera area. So this is the other one, 1815, very close to the founding of Singapore. Again, it says red cliffs. So there's no mention of the gullies. When you see gullies, it's actually, to me, it's like you are very close, or at least you can see the details of the area. Crease is just a red face, vertical face, or some slope face. And a red patch is just more generalized. But the Spain, a Spanish chart, write in very much detail, like the gullies actually. So you can actually see the, the shapes, V shapes or something, the U shape gully, the thing. So this is my, my note on this area. And uh, that's the story for the Spanish chart. So next, we move on to World War II and the approach to World War II, Changi Tree. This is the Changi Tree. Again, a lot of Latin names. Wow, this is a challenge, right? It's almost like the uh, football narrator cannot pronounce the player's name. Like <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, the name, Sindora uh, Wallachi or something. Uh, I can't, sorry. Uh, this is two Latin binomial name for the supposed species of Changi Tree. And it is supposedly 76 meters tall. This is the Changi Tree. Uh, photographed in 1936 and published on the cover of Malayan Nature Journal. If you go on the web, this is what you see. Most common uh, photograph of Changi Tree, the D Changi Tree. So on this 1938 map, uh, land topo map, Changi Tree is here. Here, never mind. I'll show you the highlight. The, this is here, Changi Tree. And then the close up. You see Changi Tree? Changi Tree is marked. So the, if you read a lot of references, uh, we go on the web, they'll say the first map is 1888. But I, I have not, again, seen enough map and charts, perhaps. The, there's no 1888, because from what I've been seeing, Changi Tree only appears in the 1920s and 30s. And as you know, 1942, in February, they blew up the tree. So after that, they won't, they, there's no more Changi Tree. But in terms of the existence of the tree on the map, I, I, I have not seen the 1888 chart which um, what you, if you search on the web now, you'll see 1888, uh, as early as 1838, but I don't have, I've not seen it. So the earliest I've seen is 1930s. It's the 30s maps and charts that shows Changi Tree. But anyway, they, they, the map, the tree does, did appear on charts and maps in Singapore. The 1830s, but not, not in the 19th century. So this is the topo map. The, this is the second edition. The first edition was published in the 1920s. Uh, there were no Changi Tree on that thing. And uh, incidentally, uh, this note here, this is a triangle. So it's used, it's marked as a, a control point, a trigonometrical station. So actually the surveyors were using it for reference control, reference purpose. And that's the reason why the British army also blew it up because the Japanese can also use it for control purpose. Uh, so they know exactly where the things are landing, artillery rounds especially. So that's the Changi tree. And this is the chart, one of the charts which I found on uh, Johor Strait. Changi tree is somewhere here. Changi Peninsula here, area. Somewhere here should be Changi tree, but it just says top of trees uh, without mentioning the tree itself. However, uh, on this kind of uh, hydrographic chart, they draw coaster sketches. Uh, and in one of the sketches, apparently you see this tall thing over here. <laughs> yeah, it's outstanding because, um, yeah, because of the screen, a little small. Uh, I've, I've turned the thing upside down. This is, this is uh, view A. So they draw views for navigators to see. So I've turned the thing. So this is view A. View A is looking uh, from the east inwards. Uh. So you'll see this is Tanjong Changi. Tanjong Changi. Tanjong Changi. And, uh, and uh, Changi River here. Changi Village is over here. So this is supposedly where Changi Tree is supposed to be. I turn over this also. This is supposed to be where Changi Tree is also. Tanjong Changi and Tanjong Changi. You're looking up this way from the east upward, uh, westward. Uh. So you can see here, because the resolution is not very clear, here, where I'm outlining here is the top of the full grown coconut tree. Thing. All these are coconut trees, uh, full grown. So even given the topography, uh, this particular tree is very outstanding. So I suspect it could be a drawing of the, the, Changi, the, the Changi tree, the Changi tree. This one, you see, outstanding. This is the full height of coconut tree. So this tree is so tall, although the, the leaf don't look like it, but, but the height seems quite 
probable uh, at the same location here, over here. This is the full height of the coconut tree here. But this tree is so outstanding, just one tree over here. Just my speculation, but um, no other explanation. So um, again, the tree was supposedly 76 meters, and I've checked the control tower of Changi. Uh, it's 78 meters. Uh. So what I do is, uh, again, I, I got to put them together. <laughs> So next time, next time, and, then, and the thing is, someone asked me, it is so uh, coincidental, uh, was this inspired by the Changi tree? So next time you go, well actually just up there, right? yeah, you go there and see the, the thing. Uh. It's almost as tall as this control tower. This is to scale, I just uh, scale up the photo to, make, to match 76 meters and put it across this 78 meters across. So see, this is how it looks like, 76 meters, how tall it should be. So from afar, now the PIE, whatever you're reaching Chinese, you can see, ah, oh, that's how tall Changi tree was. Yeah. So at, uh, last year, I went on this Tuesday report uh, and, to, and the RSA opened up the Changi base to film the area. So I, I uh, as they say, opportunity comes to those who are prepared. Uh. So I've prepared everything. I'm just waiting for the opportunity to go into the place and look. Finally, then the, the TV program said they are looking for the Changi tree. So I offered all my plans. Uh. I say I have the laptop, I have the map, I have the GPS, everything. Can I join you. <laughs> so they say, can. So I ended up on the program Say, see, map researcher Mok Lai Ying confirms the location. This is a TV program subtitle, not my subtitle. So I have to credit, I have to credit MediaCorp. Yeah, this is the thing. So I captured this particular moment. And uh, here, this is the old map, the same map which I use here. And uh, the screen, hard to see. Unfortunately, I didn't change the thing. There's a triangle symbol, which is the live feed, GPS live feed. And we are, as we walk, the the, the current feed uh, is actually overlying on, overlaying on the old map. And uh, here, the, this is the location where Changi Tree used to be. Uh, again, from the program, I didn't put this. Uh, this is from the program. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I was blocked by this lump of uh, vegetation. This was supposed to be, according to the map, the, where the tree is supposed to be. Yeah, where the location according to the map. So I cannot bash through. So we, um, so we can see the track. Hopefully you can see the track. So you see the, the dot, X dot. So we cannot block by the lump. So we walk around it. So we, I didn't bash through the, the lump of trees. Over there, same thing, this thing. Over here. So this is where we went in Changi last year to film the thing. And we went back to see the thing. So there's this interesting uh, lump of vegetation there where the trees supposedly, of course there are errors in the map and so on, but that's clear enough because the whole area is now clear land. No trees, no vegetation, except this clump of uh, vegetation over there, small one. So this is the overlay on the map, as seen on the TV. There yeah, we walk up here. So you can see many lines. Uh. <laughs> this is typical TV, uh, NG. Uh. So the director make me walk, walk, walk until <laughs> satisfactory. So do you see many, many regals? So on. this is the thing. Do you see all this? All this will rewalk. Go back again, walk again, come back here, especially here. While before approaching this tree, I told the, the cameraman exactly I see the spot already. So he said, ah, no suspense. Must go back and have some suspense. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah. Okay, that was Changi Tree. So we move on to the other aspects of the World War II. Uh, this, this is a rare, very rare survey map of uh, Changi POW compound. Uh, it was published in the uh, professional journal, the, at that time called Empire Survey Review. Now it's uh, just a survey review, no more Empire. And uh, this map was produced in the June of 1945. And it started in the early part of, it actually covers the whole area of the Changi prison camp. And was surveyed by one of the chief surveyors who, uh, who joined the volunteers and captured as a POW. So he was put inside Changi jail as a POW. So in early 1945, um, this is just overview of the map. I'll show you the detail here to tell the story. Here, you can see now A, uh, A. A, at the bottom. A is where the commandant of the prison, the Japanese officer, the general, uh, the uh, house, his, his residence. And this used to be the house of uh, Ng Seng Choi, uh, Wing Long, uh, the Wing Long Road, the tailor, famous tailor. So they commanded the house. Anyway, the Japanese general wanted to have a route uh, from Changi prison itself all the way down to his house. This route over here. So they asked the surveyors who were POWs to survey, help him survey and construct the route in early 1945. So the surveyors tried to get the equipment and so on, and they tried to survey. So they discovered that the, the, the route might have to bash through villagers' uh, attack houses. 
So they tell the Japanese, of course, this is actually the scheme uh, to try to not to work for the Japanese, but they have to appear to be working. So they work. So here, especially the junction D and E, uh, this is the detail. If they follow this alignment all the way from C, this projection line, you see, you will hit this house, and the house has to be removed, you see. So what they do is at point E, they make a kink turn so that they will miss the house. So for this little turn, they spend six months. So like that, uh, you can't earn a living in the professional surveying world if you do, do, do that. Uh. But then this is the war time. So they managed to fool the Japanese officers uh, that this is a critical uh, decision and a lot of technical difficulties in order to adjust for this survey. So they actually did this. Uh. So this is the highlight of the survey. To, to, to make this adjustment, yeah, about six months. So eventually this was, this was surveyed uh, and the map the map was actually given to the Japanese a month before uh, the official surrender. But when the war ended, they tried to search for that uh, ink, ink version. They couldn't find it. But they themselves kept the original uh, manuscript and it was quickly shipped. With the first, the humans, the surveyors are still in Changi, but the map was shipped by air back to the UK. So important was this particular map. And so it was a very rare map. Uh, that the British government at the time has formed this Directorate of Colonial Surveys. And this was the second map that was published by the DCS. Uh, DCS eventually became Ordnance Survey International and so on and so forth. The, the organization in a way still exists, uh, but that was the first, second, the second map to be published. And how important was this information to the uh, British government? That the, the humans who make this map were still in Changi. Uh. The map is already back in the UK, but the map was only redrawn in and published in 1948. And the sur surveyor who drew this map and wrote the article uh, passed away three years after 1948 and I think, due to the stress. Although he served in the First World War and uh, survived the Second World War in Changi. But after three years later, he, he died. And this is the, I quote, uh, the, from the, the paper that he wrote. This is his final sentence. In spite of the Japanese general's pompous command, not one village house was destroyed in the process of surveying 575 acres in six months to obtain the site for five, 860 yards of straight road, which had to be abandoned in an unusable condition. It's the last sentence, a monument to British compromise and Japanese obtuseness. Uh, unfortunately, I feel that sometimes today, I still feel this, uh, a monument to my compromise and something. <laughs> anyway, this is the... Changi prison area, the map they highlighted. Uh, what is interesting is um, this is a 1988 report from ACT, Australia uh, Capital Territory, when they're trying to build the Changi Chapel. So they have uh, commissioned this report. And inside there's this map, quite similar to, see this map? This map here, POW Camp Changi. Uh, the details are almost identical to this map. So I suspect that this map. Uh, was actually used as a reference to copy over the details and then add in the annotations because the, they were living mem members certainly who know exactly what building was used for what. So the details were filled in by the Australians. So this map, I think, is very valuable. And uh, I got the map by writing to the editor again to a uh, survey review. I saw the map. That's why I'm, I'm quite interested to see that the Australian government uh, contractor has this map. Because I saw it in the journal in Australian National, uh, one of the university libraries, not in the UK, but I wrote to the journal editor in the UK and he's, he promptly sent me a, a scanned copy of the map. So I'm quite surprised to see that the Australian government report also has something it's almost identical except for this, all the annotations which I can't see. This is a very low resolution map. Right? Yeah. And uh, what it is, is last year, because of the 75th anniversary of World War II thing, National Museum has this exhibition and they have restored some movies. One of the movies was King Rat. I never got to see it. And when I saw it, uh, it really shocked me. The details of the camp, Changi Prison. King Rat is an American prisoner in, uh, held in the Changi Prison, written by James Clavell, which is British. You know, Saipan and all this, uh, Shogun, all this, uh, big famous author. So this is his first, first book. And uh, this is the book. 62 came out, 65 the movie, this is, you can't see it very clearly up here. This is the Changi camp that they have built. The, the, the movie makers have built a Changi camp replica in California for the set. Yeah. Actually, the movie maker came down to Singapore to survey Changi prison. But I think the negotiations failed. Of course, it's an active prison by then. Uh, you can't use it for filming. So they actually decided to build a replica set in California for the movie. So this is the replica set. You see, the main gate of Changi. This is California. This is not Singapore. 
California. You see the tower block here, and this is the image from National Archives of Singapore, 1942. This this is so real. So when I first saw the movie last year at the National Museum, I got a shock. I said, "How oh, can they film it in Changi? Impossible!" So I dig very deep. Finally, I found the answer. They actually built one in. This is life size in the in the in California. This is disused already after the thing. But what what this is prompted me to borrow the book and read. And my goodness, when I, when I have the map beside me and I read, uh, wow, the guy really was in Changi, uh, the author. The details where the officers were keeping, keeping the chicken, vegetables, the boreholes. I didn't even know what was boreholes. Uh. To me, as a geographer, boreholes where you test the, the soil and substrate or uh, whatever. Uh. Boreholes are uh, latrines, uh, toilets. Uh. So in the movie, there was this borehole party. You know, as you know, uh, armed forces party means a group of people doing interesting things. Uh. So there are borehole parties and so on. Yeah. So that was, that was my, my thing about, that's why I, I decided to put in this map. To me, it's quite a, a very, a, how should I say, poignant map when I look at the thing, when I read the, <laughs> see the movie, read the book, and then with the map beside me. That's the thing, that's the World War II story. And now we come to the other side. Uh, the people who are trying to end the war, the chart map of Singapore, this is the official map used by the British uh, Armed Forces, chart map, a combination of land map and sea chart. So this is the chart map of Singapore, eastern approach. So on the land area, it looks like a land topographic map with all the contours and the color green. Because traditional hydrographic chart at that time, it was gray, is a single color in the, in the sand, gray scale, gray. Not, not the today, we have some yellow color, yellow for the land and blue for the waters and so on. In those days, it's all gray. And you see all these sounding, a lot of dots, actually are numbers, all these, see, numbers. So this is a combination of the thing for, this is supposedly meant for the uh, Operation Tight, Tight Race or something to recapture Singapore. Actually it was originally male, male, fest, male feast, male feast, uh, you know, armour formation, uh, have this feast thing, uh, the male feast, yeah. that was operational name to uh, liberate Singapore, but it was overtaken by events, some other new operation took place. But anyway, the maps were not produced by war's end because the Japanese surrendered before they were ready to print the maps. <laughs> So these maps become of historical interest. Uh. They were printed in 1946, when the whole entire mapping unit uh, literally came to Singapore. The mapping unit was actually HMS White Bear, whole ship, a whole survey vessel that, that moved from Ceylon to Singapore. All the facilities were on the ship. It was birthed in Sambawang and by then uh, when it came to Singapore. And they printed this map here in Singapore, this particular map. So it came about in, the, um, this is 46, 45 they wanted to print, but didn't know at time. So this is the detail of the area. So here again, this is where we are supposed to be talking now. Here, this area, Johor Shore. This is the Changi area, military area, and uh, sand and so on. And this is how this particular type of chart came about. Um, this is a traditional hydrographic chart. In 1943, British security uh, in intelligence agencies are preparing uh, intelligence for the eventual recapture of Singapore. So in 43, they started planning, uh, identifying the potential beaches along the southern coast of Singapore. All these red uh, round circles here, you see, round circles here, different beaches, and there are photographs, air photos taken of the beach, beaches, and so on. And there are write-ups of each description of the beach, each numbered beaches uh, of, the, of the area of Singapore, Singapore waters. And this is the title block. So you can see the for topographical details, you see these maps. This is the topographic map uh, references. This is actually a, a hydrographic chart that they drew on. Uh. So um, this is a detail from the hydrographic chart. So you can see the S41, S42, S43. S is for uh, shore, just a normal beach. And Singapore, Singapore beach, I mean. S is Singapore. Uh, Johor is J. Uh. And these are the write-ups of the beaches. Uh. So the area we are, this is Changi area, we are outside here, but this is the original coastline. And this is one of the right up, uh, Tanah Merah Besar, which is uh, up, up in the, near the Changi uh, runway one area. So it's quite blurry, so I type it out. It says all these descriptions. So there were intelligence agents, <laughs> I don't know what to say, it's intelligence, military intelligence that uh, probe the area and collect information about the low water and so on. So, all in all, landing should be possible at almost all states of the tide. So this, this coastal area is uh, possible for landing purposes, amphibious landing. So according to all these reports, in that, and from that time, from the, from 43, when they compiled these uh, records. 
And this is the topographic map which uh, they referred to just now, the two sheets, eight and nine, plan eight and nine, two sheets. So again, the, the, the numbers are circled over here, similar to the hydrographic chart, but this is uh, based on the topographic maps. So you can see the colors here, over here, and over here, or oh, this is the S. So each sector, they divide it into different sectors, it's easier to manage and to describe because the slope and all these things change over, over the area. And this is the, the details. So you have the beach, which is the just simple circle, and the landing place. So from the Changi area, there were no landing places, but there were potential beaches for a previous landing, so identified by this intelligence report. So they were compiled, compiled prepared in 1944 and revised 45 in May for this particular operation to liberate Singapore. And ISTD is the Inter-Services Topographical Department. It is part of the British Admiralty Intelligence Division. This is what Yen Fleming, the author of James Bond, served in the NID, Naval Intelligence Division, NI5, I think he was. He was. So this Bond, James Bond, Bond, Lieutenant Commander or something. So this is from ISTD. ISTD was actually commanded by a Royal Marines full colonel during the war years. Yeah. So he wrote a biography and happened to, to buy a copy of it. So I, I know the, the background to how it was formed and so on. And they, they nearly, in the British Admiralty, nearly, how should I say, uh, unintentionally insulted the Cambridge University's printers because they, they asked them, could you print maps? They say, do you know how long we have been in business? What kind of thing we have not printed before? That's how they phrase it. So eventually the maps are what you see. All these maps are printed by the University of Cambridge Press and University of Oxford Press, not by the regular army printers. So you can see the quality of the maps. Those maps are, are from the National Archives website. The original maps can be consulted at the National Archives. Uh, perhaps you have to twist arm or something, then you can see the original. But <laughs> it's easier to see during the war years. So, uh, so this is the ambitious thing. I included this story because I want to bring this presentation back to SG700 all the way to Singapore's beginning. This one. We have been preparing for ambitious landing in Singapore. Right? So Sun Nila Utama actually yeah, <laughs> successfully conducted an unopposed ambish, ambish, amb, amphibious landing on Singapore shore. Right? According to the, the vocabulary of this particular establishment, the Navy, I yeah, use such words. Uh. So this unopposed, I mean, no one was there to stop him. So anyway, this is, uh, this is the, the stamp series by Singh Post, 2014. They published this stamp series. Mm. He, he was involved in some storm and then he landed in Singapore and then he saw a creature and then in Singapore. That's the, that's the sequence of events. But this is not just it. What it is is um, three years ago, 2015, someone was doing some research and the questions came to me. They say that the, uh, in the Malay and uh, the, this uh, Sanila Utama was actually on Bintan. So immediately, uh, once I read the email, I actually ran down from my home to the National Library and borrow a translation and read. I can't read the Malay language version. So the version I picked at the National Library in Victoria Street really said is he was on Bintan Island. And then this is the version that you see on Wikipedia also. He was on Bintan Island. So hence, this is the question. If he was really on Bintan, can you actually see Singapore from Bintan to, to see the white sand or whatever that, that that, uh, that attracted his attention and wanted to visit the island. So is it visible or is it this DVR again? Be beyond visual range. It's the military speak. Yeah, since we are here, we respect the language of the land. Yeah, beyond visual range. Or is it visible? Because Earth is round. So like high seas, right? Yeah, you can see the, the mast, top mast before you can see the full ship. So something other. So can he actually see? So 200 years, we are 199 plus something years. No one has done research on this. Could someone see Singapore from the hills of Bintan. And if he was really on Bintan, according to the book, the first part of Singapore he would see uh, would be here, where we are standing, Tanah Merah all the way to Changi Point. Right? He wouldn't be able to see, wow, this way, the boogies, or whether to see the white sand. Right? Very complicated. <laughs> uh. Of course, he, was, he met a storm while he was attracted by this. So maybe the storm will brought him to this area and then he sort of salvaged in the other areas of Singapore. But naturally, what attracted him, would naturally, the first attraction would have been this stretch of the sand, you know, Johor Shore and all this white sand thing. And then we can see from just now, the World War II amphibious report, right? here was sandy ground. So we got trusted military intelligence that saying that here was sandy beach, suitable for landing. So he landed, so here I'm trying to be scientific. Huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, so this is the story. So here we bring ourselves back to SG 700, Sunny La Utama's days when he tried to land in Singapore. And where was Singapore that he landed actually? So he was in Bintan. But, so this is the story. So next we'll come to, since we are in uh, 700 years, so we'll go back to SG 200, the 1819 story. This one is just set. Uh, the Singapore and Arctic relationship. In the March of 2018, March of 2018, the MFA put this poster on the official website. The link is below, or you can see it. Uh, try to put in the color that contrasts with both the background of this. But anyway, you can search these keywords again, you will find this website and you'll find this poster. Why Singapore should be on the Arctic Council? What is the Arctic Council? What Singapore, why Singapore, why is it important to Singapore and what Singapore can do to it? So on, so on. Trade routes, climate change and business and so on. So I'm trying to bring this to show the relationship of a particular place name in Singapore's map and the Arctic. So this is the Singapore Arctic. And then in July, today, today, or today, today is now all online, uh, there was an opinion piece and how Singapore legitimizes its presence in the Arctic Council. So there was uh, this thing. Of course, nobody mentioned this story, which I'm going to tell you, the relationship between Arctic and Singapore. And uh, last year, I wrote this article for the Zhao Pao Sunday edition. And this is the map I'm going to show you. This 1828 map uh, published in the Crawford's uh, book in 1828, this particular part. The lower part, uh, the lower part is famous as the Jackson Plan. Yeah, so usually people know of Jackson Plan. Actually, this is a full page thing. And uh, above it is actually this whole island map. The first time the whole island map of Singapore actually was published, although there were other manuscript maps. Now we can see, it, so we don't see the significance historically of this map's appearance uh, chronologically. But in those days, this was the first map that people get to see. Anyway, this is the map. 1828. Uh, you can see uh, here, Franklin Point is over here, Tanjong Changi. Here, here, here. Franklin Point, Nanyang. So again, I'm going to. Again, uh, I tried to tell this story. Eh? So he named this starting point as Franklin Point. This was uh, again subtitled by MediaCorp. Uh, the same series, part one. Uh, they only, the interview was half an hour long. This was the only sentence they included. So here I'm to tell the full story of this Franklin Point thing. So this was circled by the program and so on. So here, the close-up of the area, Franklin Point, Tanjong Changi. So Tanjong Changi was named Franklin Point by the surveyor, Franklin. Uh, so to show where the track started, uh, the survey track actually started outside and they went westwards. So they do a counterclockwise survey of the Singapore island and get the coastline in 1822. In 1828, the map was published. Point Franklin, who was Franklin? When I first I saw Franklin, uh, this thought came to me, could it be related to someone else? But this is James Franklin, uh, after a few years of research. James Franklin was born in 1783 and he died in 1834. He was a Bengal cavalry officer. He was a captain when he first came to Singapore. He was promoted to captain only on the 1st of January, 1819. Uh, more importantly, uh, he was on leave uh, upon personal affairs. UPA is upon personal affairs to Singapore from October 1821 to April 1822. And that's when the map, the survey was conducted, when he was here upon personal affairs. So he, he asked if the resident uh, commandant, uh, Fakwa, uh, Fakke or something, that <laughs> if there was a map of Singapore, the answer was no. So he immediately set about surveying this thing by, all by himself because he, had, uh, he was actually uh, working seconded uh, in a way to the survey department of India in India while doing survey works. Uh, so he wasn't really well and uh, he went on leave back to the UK less than a year after he, he, he came to Singapore for rest and recuperation because he, really, really, he did not really rest in Singapore. He went to survey the coastline of Singapore when he was unwell resting here. So he, uh, he, he wasn't well so he went back again. He wasn't well again and uh, then he went back to India. So finally, uh, he succumbed to his uh, sickness uh, and he died in the 31st of August, 1834. This is James Franklin's story. So I read about James Franklin. My mind came to this other person. Um, okay, anyway, I, I skipped that part. This is uh, where he came from, uh, Spilsby, Lincolnshire. And uh, the drill hall, formerly we also have a drill hall at the beach road there, the Singapore Volunteer Corps drill hall, which is where the volunteer soldiers uh, gather and so on, train. So the drill hall in Spilsby is now named Franklin Hall in honor of the Franklin, Franklin family. Uh, actually, his brother, this, this person. <laughs> I, want to, I want to talk about a brother. Okay, never mind. Anyway, this is, uh, there's no surviving um, image of 
James Franklin. This is uh, his memorial at, in St. James Church in Spills Bay, in Lincolnshire. And the photo was taken by Francis Campbell. This is the memorial. He, he is, I believe, buried somewhere in London. He died in Greenwich, uh, James Franklin. Uh, he was buried somewhere in London. And this is a photograph taken at his hometown, the church. And Francis Campbell is the great, 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 great granddaughter of James Franklin. And unfortunately, she passed away uh, in 2011. So last year, when I was trying to uh, do this research for the bicentennial thing again, I wrote her an email and there was no response. And some, a couple of months later, the husband wrote back and informed me that she had passed on some years back. Yeah, so very sad. Do this kind of research, very bad for health. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, I finally come to this part. This is the part when I first read about Franklin on Singapore map because I've long known about this Sir John Franklin, the Arctic explorer, much longer than James Franklin of Singapore's Point Franklin. So this is the, the Sir John uh, Franklin, this guy. So he, um, he went on four expeditions to the Arctic, trying to find the Arctic Northwest Passage. That means to find uh, what we are trying to do now, to sail across the Arctic, to cut short the thing for trade and other businesses. This is him, uh, John Franklin, uh, the youngest uh, brother of James Franklin. So on his last expedition in 1845, he, he was um, lost, uh, trapped in the Arctic and never came back. And apparently he died in June 1847. And the uh, wife, Lady Franklin, sponsored seven expeditions to find him. So, so famous that uh, a song was written, Lady Franklin's Lament. You can search on YouTube. And uh, what's the lady uh, who recently converted to Islam? The, she, yeah, she, she sang this song too. Yeah, so this how famous this Lady Franklin's Lament was. Is uh, like the yeah, this whole operation. So she, Lady Franklin, was determined to find the outcome or whereabout of the husband. It was never known. So what did this company to know that in the last couple of years, in September 2014 and September 2016, two ships, the wrecks were finally discovered. So the Canadian government has finally found where the two ships were, and now they are national historic sites in Canada. This is the last expedition. And Franklin's, uh, this is a map from 1901. This is the expense of Canada. And this map is published by Stanford, a famous map publisher of London. Hence, the colour is in British Empire pink. This is pink. If you can't see it, it's pink. This is huge expense of Canada. And here, up here, is northern part. Northern part here, you will see this district called Franklin District. It is no longer there because that area has now been carved to form a new uh, territory known as uh, Nunavik. So uh, people jokingly call it none, none of it, but it's Nunavik. That's another part of Canada. So there's now another territory and all these old European names have been removed, replaced by local names. But this is the Franklin District. So this is where this is where his expedition actually ended. So finally, with the discovery of the wrecks, these final days and track could be reconstructed. This is uh, from uh, Wikipedia. So this was the area, yeah. somewhere here also, this area, the Franklin district. So they knew where he disappeared, but they could not find him exactly. But now, finally, they know where he is, but they found his uh, tomb as well. So if you read National Geographic magazine, over the years, they show all these uh, well-preserved frozen sailors coming out from this Canadian Arctic. So this is from the Franklin expedition. So to me, the memory and the impression last very long. So when I read about Franklin of Singapore, the first thought was actually, was this guy related somehow to this Arctic explorer? And turn out, my goodness, I think I nearly cried. This is uh, what I read from his biography, John Franklin, the life of John Franklin. The year 1834 was saddened for John Franklin by the death of his last surviving brother, James, who had returned from India in broken health and had now but a few months to live. So he actually, James died in the hands of uh, John Franklin, while John was on, uh, on leave before in between assignments. So after he died in 1836, Sir John Franklin was appointed governor of uh, Tasmania, Von Damien's land at the time. So he went over there. And James, James Franklin had a daughter, uh, still young at the time. So John Franklin and Lady Franklin, adopt, in a way, adopted her, like become her guardian, and brought her along all the way to Tasmania. And in 1838, so you see another piece of news, that the James' daughter, Mary Franklin, married in Tasmania. So James Franklin's family is now found in Tasmania. 
and not no longer in the UK. So this is the, the search, uh, global search. And uh, of course, uh, some other branch, like the Francis Campbell is from a very distant line, uh, convoluted line. She, she told me her, her lineage, uh, so uh, very complicated. So originally, I, would, I wanted to end the story here on the not quite happy note. However, someone volunteered a happy news just yesterday. So I have a, I'm obliged to <laughs> need the thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Since we are talking about Canada, and I love Canada so much, and he, he volunteered this photograph. So uh, <laughs> this name here, Francis James Bennett. You know, I talk about Franklin and all this uh, and uh, surveyor. He is a cavalry officer, land lover. How did he go about surveying the thing? Francis James Bennett rented him the book and the services. So um, a few years after Frank uh, Farquhar left the post because of this resignation, Francis James Bennett wrote in to his successor, John Crawford, and asked for compensation. And then, uh, of course, Crawford gave him the, uh, yeah, ignore him, uh, to say politely. <laughs> so this is the story. So when he when I saw this news yesterday, I was laughing because this name <laughs> is the sponsor, in a way, of Franklin Survey around Singapore. He supplied the ship and the services to him because at that time he was serving as a one time master attendant of Singapore. I think this got relationship uh, because his, uh, his father in law was the resident and the commandant in Singapore at that time. Yeah, but of course, this is just for the presentation. So, with this, I end my presentation.